Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Eurowatch. You may have noticed a new jingle in the intro. We can thank our lovely co-host, Ritik, for that. He's managed to build that on his iPhone. I still won't know how. Uh, we're filming in the week before Christmas. So, Ritik, what are you doing for your holidays? Because I can tell you your answer's going to be less depressing than mine. I'm going to meet my cousin and her family and my little yeah it's already better than mine nephew. it's already better than mine <laughs> i'm in i'm in i'm in a tier four in um england we've got a new strain of covid we've been told directly to um stay home i was gonna see some uh family i was gonna see some girlfriend's family i'm now locked inside so uh i'm jealous well brexit means brexit <laughs> <laughs> On that point, um, however, let's switch back to European football because we've got a different episode for all of you today. Uh, instead of uh, running down our two teams like we usually do, Alex picks one and I pick the other, we thought we'd try to switch it up. You know, last part of the year, we're going to tell you and we're going to shed some light on three footballers who we really think are worth following uh, for these next Euro, uh, Euros in the mm -hmm. summer. Um, I've got three. Alex has got three. And Alex, who are you most looking forward to first? Well, I must say before we kick off Ritik, we've almost escaped last week's uh, mystery player, which I'm happy to tell you someone uh, on Twitter has tweeted in. Oh. And guess who? So, before, like I said before we begin, we must shout out Andy Goldie. He guessed our Eurowatch mystery player correctly. I'm going to repeat to you, Ritik, to see if you can guess it, uh, the three hints I had. I was thinking of a player knocked out by France in 2016 Euros after being subbed off. He's since played in England, Italy and Germany, and he now plays with a Swiss, Norwegian and Danish. Ritik, who do you think that is? Off the top of your head. English. He now plays in which leagues? He's played in which league since? He now, he, he, he now, he's since played in, in England, Italy and Germany. He now plays in Germany. You get one guess. Oh my, he now plays in Germany. <laughs> Uh, so knocked out by France, uh, plays in Germany, might be a journeyman German player. I'm, I'm blanking out. I'm blanking out. Well, he played with a Swiss, Norwegian and Danish player. It was M. Ray Chan and at, at Andy Goldie on Twitter, A-N-D-Y-G-A-G-U-A-D-I. Guessed him first time completely. Well done to him. And the rest of the viewers can wait till the end of the show for my, uh, my, my other one, which might be a bit. Easier, but enough of the daily daily like you said. So I was cover. right about German Johnny man. Oh wow, <laughs> you was indeed. What a, what, a, what a strange career Emre Chan has had. I will say in my three players, I've not gone for any Ger German German man. I haven't actually gone for any journeyman. I I'm gonna like you said kick things off with um my first player. I'm going to pick uh, who I think will be doing, having a very good Euros in next year. Yusuf Yazici. Are you aware of the name? My Leo, uh, do tell me a bit more, Alex. Okay, so for the viewers who might not know his name, he's relatively new on the scene. He plays for Lille in a uh, league game, and he's Turkish international. He's 23 years old. Now, Yazici is part of a Lille side that, as of recording, they're about an hour away from playing PSG in a big league game tie. Lille currently top of the league. This is the First time that's happened, well, the second time that's happened in the last 10 years in France. So this is a really big season for Lille. And Yuzichi's been exceptional in that. He's scored two hat tricks in the Europa League. He's been playing as like a deep lying forward. And his ball control, his shooting, his passing, link up play has been outstanding. So is he the, is he the Turkish Harry Kane then? Turkish Harry Kane? That's an interesting comparison. I'll tell you, his, his play style. I'm trying to think of someone who's a bit more like, because there's someone else in the team, in the Turkish team, I'm actually going to come on to in a bit, who I would consider the more of the Harry Kane. He's, Yuzici's a bit more like what Chelsea fans were sold on Kai Havertz. He's like, he's very all rounded. He's actually been played out on the wing at certain times under little manager Christian Gaultier. And for Turkey, he's played out on left mid and right mid and also up front. He, for Turkey, I do not believe he scored too many goals. I think it's under uh, under 10 inside 20 appearances. But he's really kicked on this. He's actually got one of the most minutes in Liga. And I think he's got, uh, I think he's shooting the most times in France as well and taking um, the most key passes 
in Lille. So I'm actually really excited for him. I've written about him recently for Get French News. And Shameless I blood. Think, yes, and I think uh, I think he can lead Turkey to an interesting thing. Ritik, what do you think? What do you think about Turkey as well in general? I mean, Turkey has always got you know, this uh, big tournament show up caliber. I mean, I, I, my mind's obviously casted back to the good old days of 2002 where you had Rushti and his, um, uh, you know, his little eye makeup to make him look like a warrior. But even as the years have gone on, Turkey have had, you know, decent crops of players coming in here and there. Um, with regards to Turkey right now, they seem to have a bit more of a team that's focused more on the 20 to 26 age bracket. And that might be good for them. Um, it's 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 hard to say where they will go. I mean, when, when you position them against teams such as Portugal or maybe even England or maybe even the likes of Wales, um, I think Turkey can like go toe to toe to them, toe to toe with them in the uh, you know the group stages or, or even the early knockouts. What they've been lacking is that prolific goal scorer, and I think they might have that with um, Nizici because. When I said like the German, when I said uh, the Turkish Hurricane, the actual player who came into my mind was um, when Miguel Michu used to play for Swansea City, because he oh, yeah. originally started off as a midfielder and then started playing up front, and then between that um, end of the midfield circle to the start of the D, he was absolutely potent. Uh, he was getting assists, he was getting goals, he was being a target man, going out wide. And Yazici at some points, um, you know, in this French season has been playing, uh, wrecking havoc absolutely with uh, uh, the French, uh, def- I mean, the defenders in Liga. And I feel that if the team and the attack is really centered around him, the Turkish team, that is, there can be a lot of goals to be found. And at, with these tournaments, you know, goals win the games. You can draw a bunch of games and you can roll the dice by coming third in the group and hoping you're the best. But um, yeah, as long yeah. as Yazici is on the pitch, it seems like a goal is a possibility. Should, should Turkey go kind of far into the competition? I believe they'll, if they, let's say they finish second in their group, Group A with Italy, they'll come across Portugal. And I believe from Portugal, you've picked a, a certain wonder kid, haven't you, Ritik? Yes, um, it com- comes to comes as no surprise when you say Wonder Kid and Portuguese that I am talking about Joao Felix. Um, unlike, actually, it it is kind of a similar story to Renato Sanchez, who also won the FIFA Golden Boy Award as Felix. Uh, went on to have a great Euro tournament and then sort of just dipped off from there. Felix seems a little. Di- <laughs> Definitely, and with Felix, it's a little different because. He went from Benfica to Atletico Madrid, and he went for 120 million euros. One of the most expensive young players of all time. One of the most expensive transfers of all time. It's very strange that Atletico shelled out as much as they did for him, especially considering he came in with uh, the exit of Antoine Griezmann. Now, where Felix, um, you know, sort of had a stop-start um, beginning to his life at Atleti, he really started to kick on in the second half of the year. You know, coming in from deep, building the ball up, playing those one-two passes, rolling the ball with the sole of his foot and an extortionate amount of times, which I, as a futsal player, really appreciate. And this season, he's just um, exploded from there. He has uh, eight goals, five in the La Liga, three in the Champions League, and three assists as well. He's combining phenomenally with uh, the likes of Saul, Suarez, Diego Costa, becoming the first boss from, uh, you know, even the fullbacks like Lori. He's sort of that kind of player who I feel Simeone might want to build the future of Atleti around. He's a former golden boy. He's obviously in a super, super talented uh, Portuguese team. And he yeah, could what just role do you think act- he plays in that? Well, because there is, you've got Ronaldo, you've got Bernardo Silva, and you've got an Arsenal deeper, but there's, there's a, Plenty of attacking depth there. What does Felix fit into that? Because I've heard things like he's not a complete striker. He plays a bit deeper, but then he's not too much of a winger, right? Where where do you where where has he played so far? Where, where do you see him playing as well in future? Eagle-eyed viewers um, who follow the Serie, um, you've probably seen how well Alvaro Morata has been performing this season, especially with Cristiano Ronaldo. And that, I feel, has shown a bit of a blueprint of where Felix can be the most effective. Now, he comes in as either the second striker 
uh, the attacking midfielder or a more withdrawn center forward. Bruno Fernandez is unlikely to play the same role he does at United, um, where he's pretty much sort of like the attacking midfielder CF combo, yeah. akin to what Messi was for so many years for Barcelona. But uh, Felish is someone who will bring the ball in from deep, dribble it well, hold it so that players such as Jota, players such as Ronaldo and Fernandez can, you know, get into wider positions, stretch the stretch the defenders wide, and then have someone like Ronaldo just come in and swoop for the header. His passing range is actually very underrated. Um, mm. you know, I know he scores and assists, but his long range and short range passing, especially out of pressure when he's coming in from the wing to the inside, mm. has been one of Atleti's biggest weapons. Um, and I feel that wherever he is played by Fernando Santos in the Portuguese side, anywhere in the front three or front four, I think he'll be very effective because Bernardo Silva has not been having a good time. I, I would say for the yeah. last 14 or so months, he's been very muted. He's, start, mm. he's playing pretty much as a, you know, a number eight, number 10 backup at City right now when he flourished the best as their right winger. But now they have Riyad Mahrez and Ferran Torres. And that sort of hit his confidence a bit. And, where his confidence falls, you know, Felish can just rise. He's a mercurial talent. He's got a great, great young and experienced Portuguese team around him. This is a sort of condition where boys become men. And this is where Felish could really stamp his authority. Um, right. But going on from Felish, you know, it's, it's definitely something I've, you know, he's certainly a player I've always had a very deep interest in. But uh, you had your eye on someone else too, haven't you? So I don't well, think someone else have got that sort of deep feeling. I'll tell you what, I've never. There's one player that I think you're referring to. He's uh he's Yazici's teammate, as you can tell. I've uh, centered a lot of this research around the team I'm becoming to support Lil. Uh, it's Burak Yulmaz. Yulmaz, I will try and keep him a bit quicker because although he's got an illustrious career, it's it's hard. It's very hard to adjust. He's played in Turkey for. So I think it's over 15 years now. He's 35 years old. So you were right in saying Turkey's got a designated profile of player that 21 to 26 years old. He's each he definitely goes into that. You so um got Emre Moore and things like that. But Yilmaz has moved to moved out of Turkey for the first time in his career. And at 35, you think most players at this time are winding down. He has been inspirational to watch. Both in the Europa League, but mainly in France, as I've mentioned, Lille were leading an unlikely title. He he's a man filled with energy, and he just he leads the press. He gets into incredible goal scoring positions. I mean, let me read you off his stats. He's played fourteen games. He's scored six goals, four assists in a four four two formation for a thirty five year old. That is fantastic. He's averaging uh, over uh, I believe it's two point five shots a game as well in France. He, when you watch him, it fills you with so much emotion. And the fact that he, he, the fact is, he hasn't retired from football. I know some people might be catching me out on that. He's actually still playing for Turkey at this stage. And with Turkey as well, this is where Yuzic is going to come into power. And Ritik, I know you're a fan of uh, La Liga. <laughs> How much do you know of uh, Enes Unal at the moment? I feel like I'm going to learn a lot more about him in the next uh, minute. <laughs> And a half. So go ahead, Alex. Well, I'm, I'm surprised. He, I'm not surprised that much about him. He's a, obviously the former Man City uh, youngster, and there's a reason I'm talking about him now in relation to Yuzici because he's Turkey's other proper recognised striker, other than Everton's uh, Cenk Hosen or former striker. And um, Unal has really failed to kick on as the only other real Turkish striker. He's he moved to Tafta at the start of the season. He's had ten games. And he hasn't scored or assisted. So honestly, if you're the Turkish manager, you're probably going to be lining up with Yazici and Yilmaz up front. And that is kind of like my part two of why I, I we were never going to do a full episode on Turkey. But this is my justice to them. I think even if they don't win, uh, even if they don't get out of their group next season, they're in a group of Italy, Wales. Uh, Wales is a player going to be in there as well. And Switzerland, which is it's not the group of death that uh, Felix is in with... Uh, France, Germany, Hungary, but it's a tough one. I'm excited personally to watch them because I think the passion that Yilmaz will invoke and the skill that Uzici will have and the fact they're both playing at the same club at Lille. It bodes well. 
it's gonna for be the rest really of the team. Like, yeah, exactly. And this is where I like this. This is the point I like coming to is I've largely seen in tournaments um, a two striker system, especially with one withdrawn and one ahead, mm-hmm. can be very very good because usually when you have a you know a crystallized four three three or crystallized four two three one, there are roles each player needs to play. They don't really. Um, you know, ch- swap and change their roles too much because, you know, all these players are playing with different teams and when they come together for the national team, it's not very easy to get them all playing at a telepathic level. But when you have uh, Yezici and Yelmaz playing together at Lille, you know, it bodes really well for the Turkish national mm. team because these are players, either Yelmaz drops deep and becomes a center forward, lets Yezici run on the wings, make those curved runs in, or both of them sort of, uh, you know, create havoc by occupying both the center backs, leaving the space for either midfielder or um, someone from the wing to come in. Um, it bodes pretty well for their chances that both of them do play together. And exactly. I'm glad yeah. that um, I'm glad that those are the sort of uh, two players that you really choose to go together because it, it, it gives, it gives, uh, the, it gives um, the viewers a bit of a different dynamic to what they might traditionally think of uh, Turkey. Yeah, exactly. And tell you what, they, Turkey obviously one of the more less spoken about team but and like we don't know too, i i didn't know too much about them before going into this i'm sure you didn't either tell you what there's a there's well just to lead into your next player uh i believe it's mateo kovacic from croatia right i've heard mm. nothing about croatia since the world cup apart from some kind of dodgy results against england and kovacic similarly last year was chelsea's player of the year and this season struggling for minutes ritik talk me through why do you think he's gonna have a really good tournament well, um, I will start this off by maybe talking about, uh, not maybe, I, I will start this off by talking about Croatia's run in the World Cup, where Kovacic really didn't play that big of a role. You had uh, Brozovic, Modric, um, and um, one of my f- one of my old favorites, you know, people playing uh, FIFA 16 or even career mode back then will know Milan Badel, formerly of Fiorentina. Those were the three midfielders. They were experienced midfielders. They knew how to, uh, you know, take advantage of good situations. They knew how to come out the back. Um, and when Kovacic, you know, tried to break through that, he wasn't able to start with that much ferocity. Yeah. And he ended up getting more sub appearances. Now, when he moved from Real Madrid to Chelsea, it was a big roll of the dice. And he had a pretty, you know, muted first campaign. It was a lone campaign. Um, but with Chelsea, you know, having the transfer ban, Kovacic coming in, no other players coming in and Hazard going out. This was the stage for Kovacic to really build himself. And he did. Last year, um, both with Croatia and with uh, Chelsea, he had very, very good leadership performances, especially with Chelsea. And where you saw the differences between where he was at Real and where he has at Chelsea, you can really see where I'm coming from. Because where he had, you know, Tony Cruz doing most of the mopping up in defensive midfield when he was at Real. At Chelsea, he sort of taken that role, whereas N'Golo Kante, you know, wasn't um, that ever present for Chelsea last season, either in form or fitness. Very Kovacic good. sort of took over, got the ball, turned the shoulder quickly from the first pass out of defence and had a, you know, huge panorama of passing that he could um, take on. And that's where I feel Kovacic will be the most potent Um in the sort of more deepest lying midfielder role. Uh, though Croatia do play a double pivot, largely with um, either Badel, Brozovic, or Modric, either one of the two playing, or and, you know, with Ivan Rakitic playing just ever so slightly forward, this yeah. is where Kovacic can be the best. Because Luka Modric has not slowed down. He had a pretty lackluster campaign after winning the Ballon d'Or, um, and that's actually led to some bad results. And most of the bad results for Croatia this season, they've lost, I believe, four out of their last seven games. And out of those four games, three games did not have Kovacic. And with Kovacic, mm. they do a lot better in terms of how quickly they can transition from defense to midfield as well as from midfield to attack. Yeah, And it's very crucial that you have that kind of player. Whereas Modric will still be the tank and engine till he you know, drops down on the pitch. God forbid that happens. Um, Kovacic is a kind of passer and ball interceptor that a, f- a tournament setting is built for. Yeah, just and... to interject as well, I mean, I, I'm actually going to back you with Kovacic just in terms of I thought something in relation to the group at the Euros. Uh, Croatia have England, Scotland, and the Czech Republic. The vast majority of English Scottish players will be playing in the Premier League. 
And that's that's not an unknown audience for Mateo Kovacic. In fact, obviously, you're going to probably have... I, I think you might have Rhys James sneak into the England team. You, depending on Ruben Loftus-Cheek's season, you might see him sneak into there. There's going to be a Mason Mount as well. You're going to see some Chelsea players in there that he will know very well. And I'll tell you what, I as a midfielder, and if going into the Euros, I'd want to know who I'm facing. I don't want to come against sort of unknown prospects from Europe. It might bode well for him. I'll give you that. I mean, known entities are always advantageous, but I've... As I've, as I've come to watch more football, I've begun downplaying that sort of familiarity, uh, you know, breeds better understanding. I feel the only place where it can actually be really potent is between a striker and a goalkeeper of the same team. Now, because a lot, because when you're battling in midfield, your focus is largely on your team first and progressing the ball. Um, even when you, let's say Croatia come up against uh, England, um, England don't play the same formation that Chelsea does. They don't utilize the players in the same manner. Reese James doesn't get that much freedom. He's forced to be a bit more defensive for England. Mason Mount is uh, <laughs> oh, a lovely um, talking point for all England fans and even the manager. But he also has to adjust his game a bit more. So it's it's more about Kovacic having to focus on his own team first. Um and yes, it does. It does bode well that he is more familiar with how they play, um, yeah. and he can sort of, you know, guide some of his midfield compatriots to knowing where the holes might be in their system. But when it comes to the tournament, your mind just switches to a different aspect. For a friendly, maybe you know that kind of cerebral understanding and application would work a peach. Yeah. But when you're in a tournament condition where every game is do or die. Um, it, it there's a sort of instinct that kicks up in you that overrides that, you know, that top, um, yeah. oh, I know how this player plays, I know how I can exploit him. It overrides that, and that's where I feel like Kovacic will really stamp his authority. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point, that's a fair point. I mean, we've mentioned, uh, going into our final players now, we've mentioned uh, just now England and Scotland. There's one nation missing in there that's, of course, going to the Euros, which is Wales, and I've picked, for my final player I think is going to do very well at the Euros, is Ethan Ampadu. Ampadu, obviously, has been at Sheffield United on loan this season because um, Chelsea have bought all the centre-backs in the world and he hasn't really been able to find a game time there like at RB Leipzig last season. But um, Ampadu at Sheffield has been actually pretty ever-present, um, even in their dour still. The thing is with Ampadu, though, for his country, he's a different beast. In the UEFA Nations League this season, he started six games started every single one and I, I remember watching him um i remember watching him about a couple of years ago for wales it was just before he picked up quite a big injury and he was still he was trusted completely at the base of midfield i i think with wales we've mentioned before how with gareth bale coming back especially into more game time at tottenham and their previous uh, euro campaign where they they had the nation behind them and lots of energy behind them managed to propel them quite well. They're in a group with Turkey and Switzerland and Italy. That's definitely a group they could be second or third in. I think with Wales, if you've got the combined enthusiasm of a Gareth Bale rejuvenated, we know he, Wales is top over Real Madrid and golf. <laughs> but <laughs> you combine that with Ethan Ampadu's discipline. He's very disciplined. A young man. How old is he? I think he is 20. Yeah, 20 now. He just turned 20. He's just I, 20. Yeah. He's ditched the dreadlocks. He's gotten serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm actually very hopeful for him. And I hope he has a really good tournament. I think there'll be drive within him, within him as well. Just because he he's spoken a lot how he, he does want to make Chelsea. And Frank Lampard's spoken about his quality. He, ever since he moved, I believe, from Exeter, there's been a lot of I, I, I think that Ampadu will be going into this tour with something to prove, knowing that Rudiger is probably on the way out, could be on the way out, Thiago Silva will be aging. But yeah, that's, that's my little uh, pose of Ampadu. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on Wales yeah, as well? Um, Wales, again, tricky, tricky to really understand. Um, there's no real you know, solid, solid standout talent. There are good B-plus players. The mercurial players who, you know, just are off the boil. Um, I don't even think they can rely on um, 
Gareth Bale anymore. Ryan Giggs has had his own personal problems that have been uh, wrecking havoc with the team. Mm -hmm. But with Ampadu, I think, and what I saw, you know, even though they lost 3-2 to United last week, is he didn't seem phased. He was still making the tackles. He was still mocking his men. He probably the only thing he lacks, and, you know, that's probably down to age, is the communication between the centre-backs and the right-backs. But as you said, he's a different based beast for Wales. And that always brings me down to, you know, the points I've been making throughout the weeks is that international tournaments and playing for your country just bring out something different in you. Because yeah. it's, it's especially if you're 20 years old, you know, you really know that your position is not certain. Um, you know, you're not as, as a, twi- as a young center back as well, you know, it's, it's, it's a very risky position for a young player to start off at you know you see a lot of young english english talents start off either as defensive midfielders or fullbacks and then are brought into the central defensive fold um it's it's very interesting he's playing at a decent level at sheffield you know they're still in the premier league they might be rock bottom but this will really strengthen ampadu's resolve because he knows he like he, he he's he's been given the responsibility at sheffield and um He's been given the time. He'll be. He's given. He's been given the time at Sheffield, which very few players in his position at his age are ever afforded. Um, it's up to him to become a bit more of a leader and become the kind of player that you know Wales will need. Um, I don't. I'm not really hopeful for Wales's chances. Um, but you know, I could be wrong. I That's could fair enough. That's fair wrong. enough. Yeah. So, I mean, that, your last player, I believe, he he used to play for the same club Ampadu's currently. Uh, well, he used to play as a loose sum. <laughs> he was on the books, as everyone is at Chelsea at one point in their lives. Uh, Go on, introduce the man, introduce the man. Yeah, um, Chelsea players will know the name Hazard, but uh, it's the younger brother, Torgan, who has always been piquing my interest. Um, he started really playing for Belgium um, at the last World Cup. His brother Eden said, you know... Uh, after the great tournament he had, he's like, the greatest joy of um, this World Cup is being able to play, play with my brother. I love you, bro. And it's it's beautiful. I remember, I know every time I play football with my brother and I assist him for a goal, it's one of the best feelings ever. Yeah. But it's it, it's Dogen time now because um, uh, Hazard has been disappointing me. His fitness has been off the boil. His form has never really gotten off as, as soon as he's joined Real Madrid. His last season at Chelsea was amazing. But since then, it's just been flat. And... I don't think he really has that mentality to push on and become the player he was once was at Chelsea. However, Togan Hazard, his younger brother, um, he has been quietly having a very good past couple of years. Ever since he, you know, really broke out um, at Borussia Mönchengladbach uh, after transferring from Vitesse Arnhem, uh, he has been the kind of, and I'll put it this way, for Belgium and even for Borussia Dortmund, Togan Hazard is that Swiss Army knife that every team needs he's... i watched dortmund quite a lot he's some he'll, he'll play right wing left wing left wing back center mid he's all over the place with that as for well. borussia dortmund this season alone he's played left wing uh right wing center forward and attacking midfield and he had 14 <laughs> assists last season and nine goals this season um three and three but that's par for the course for dortmund for belgium he's played a right wing back left wing back left wing and at times even attacking midfield so there is such a wide gambit of positions he plays and the best part is he is a seven to eight on ten in each of them where it comes to belgium is he usually starts either as a left wing back or a right wing back which has been a problem position for martinez for a while now while it worked at you know the last world cup i feel the novelty has worn Mm -hmm. off a bit Mm -hmm. for the red devils because um Apart from Azad, the only other the the players he usually plays in those positions are players like Nasser Charlie, who right now, if I'm not mistaken, plays for um, uh, Istanbul hey, Basak Shahir, um, yeah. and he's and he's really not good at that position. And you saw that shown out because when Thomas Munier was injured for the semi-finals, I believe against um, uh, it was against France in yeah. the semi-finals. You saw how easily Rakitic and Modric were just double teaming up on Chadley and getting back. And I strongly believe that that absence of a better option at right wing back cost Belgium the game. And I sort of unfairly, not unfairly, but harshly put that uh, responsibility on um, Nasser Chadley. But this is where Togan's game has really evolved. 
now that he's playing those more defensive positions for Belgium, he's being afforded a bit more freedom. Because as a right wing back and a left wing back, your mentality has to be different than if you're a full back. You get the ball, you drive it up pretty much on your own. There isn't usually a player in front of you. Um, play the one twos, get up and cross. That's it's very simple, but it requires a lot of pace, a lot of mobility. And you've been seeing that trend a bit with players like Jesus Navas of Sevilla and Lucas Vasquez of Real Madrid, where you know these players are going right wing and right back and switching on those positions. And it makes it makes Torgan Hazard a much more rounded player. It makes him a much more capable player. It makes him someone that you can rely on to play a multitude of positions and. You know, as long as you're on the pitch, you can affect the game. And I feel okay. that that's what Torgan has had. And, you know, I, I know you've been watching the Bundesliga off and on. Um, and, you know, where where does Torgan Hazard strike you as you know, sort of being effective? That's a good question. When I've watched Dortmund this season, I, I have to admit, I've been, I, I was actually one of the people who was for Lucien Favre's second. I think they've been quite poor. I think their build-up play has been really slow and monotonous. And, I, I'm actually pretty happy he's gone. With Hazard, I always felt like he was one of those players that just kind of came on and did, like, like it's all you said in the terms of it's always a 7 to 8 out of 10. He comes on and he just does whatever job he's asked of, but he's, he never puts a foot wrong. I think, you see, I, when I think of Hazard, I don't tend to think of him driving up the pitch so much. But I, what I really like about him is his link up play. I think he's one of the best players in the Bundesliga on the, when he's playing uh, around the edge of the box. So he could possibly be good, especially if he's on. I believe he's a right-footed player. I think he'd probably be very good on a like a left wing back position, like cutting inside, being allowed to go as like an inverted ball back. But do you really think, like, just to end it off, do you really think he like he is one of the players for Belgium that could really make a difference for them? Let me put it this way: He is the most potent Hazard Belgium have, and I am not going to change my mind. Um, yes, um, especially when you have players like um, Romelu Lukaku in the form he's in, it takes the pressure off Kevin De Bruyne to really come up with the creative passing, uh, because Hazard really gels well with so many of the other defensive midfielders. Yuri Tielemans, uh, for example, he mm-hmm. balances in really well. He gets the ball up to players like Dries Mertens. He can play one twos. He can cross. He has the pace to get in. He's not the best at every position. There are probably every, every position probably has a better player, in a, yeah. in a sense. But you need you need you need the you need the you need the um, grease to you know make sure the gears are turning. And this is where and this this is what the tournaments are built for. They're built for players like this to mop up after attackers who are having a bad day, to mop up after defenders who are getting pressured. This token hazard represents a kind of glue that will really keep Martinez's his unit cohesive. And going forward, I think he'll be a player who will get the time and space to really make an impact. Okay. All right. Well I think we've got on log enough there. Uh, that I I guess we'll be proven right or wrong in around six months' time. But thank you for listening, everybody. And before we wrap up, Ritik, I've got, uh, the, as promised, the Mystery Eurowatch Player of the Week. This will go out in a tweet as well. So we have the ability, and people have the option to tweet it straight and see if they can get it. Right. I am a top European striker who has won a major to- international tournament, but only won one league title in my I won the league in my homeland, and it was a famous title win all the way back in 2012. In the World Cup 2018, I played nearly every minute for my country, but he only got one shot on target in over four matches. You have until the next episode, when we record that, to guess that, everybody, when this goes up. So I wish you the best of luck. I wish you the best of luck, Ritik. Don't say who it is if you've guessed it, but do you know who it I is? I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a Scooby-Doo. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you've got until we next record to give a shout out to yourself. But once again, thank you, everybody. And Bye-bye. stay safe and uh, happy holidays from Alex, myself, mm-hmm. the entire team at Alate de Football. Um, hope this next year is much better than the year before. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you. There we go. Woo. Wait, let me get Craig to leave first. So we know he's recorded at least.